I'm Dr. Lori Morbis from Plant-Based Telehealth. In this week's webinar, Dr. Chris Miller and I answer many questions regarding a whole food plant-based diet and much more. We have weekly webinars occurring every Sunday at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. If you'd like to pre-register for our webinars, please click the link below and we hope to see you there. We are making plant-based lifestyle medicine available to everyone who desires it. With telemedicine, we are removing barriers that prevent many people from accessing this type of care. Lifestyle medicine promotes healthy behaviors and when adopted, individuals can expect improvement and in many cases, reversal of chronic disease. Okay, so today we were going to talk about basically starting on a whole food plant-based diet and maybe some of the things that as a physician I worry about my patients that they may be running into trouble, especially if they're like on insulin or blood pressure pills. So looks like we're streaming live on Facebook now. So excellent. So uh, welcome everybody back to the webinar. These are live Q and A's with the plant-based doctors. It's myself, Dr. Lori Marvis in Dr. Chris Miller. You want to say hi, Chris? Hi everyone. Welcome. And Chris is in New Hampshire. Um, New wait, Hampshire are you in Vermont? In You're in New Hampshire. <laughs> I forget. Work in Vermont. We're in New Hampshire. And this is plant-based telehealth and, um, please check out plantbasedtelehealth.com if you're looking for a plant-based doctor, but we just want to have these webinars every week to share information that you may have regarding nutrition or lifestyle. And today it's really answering all types of questions you may have about getting started on a plant-based diet, or if you've been doing it for a while, if you have some concerns or some questions, struggling with something. And so Chris, you want to give us a little uh, intro into how do you approach someone new who's entering a whole food plant-based diet? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Nice to see everyone. Have you all here today? Um, so with the plant-based diet, I always like to start with where a person is. So for all of you guys who are here today, I don't know uh, where you are in your journeys or what you're eating. Or, and um, so we'll just assume that you're kind of moving right along and know a little bit about this already. Um, and then it's also important to know what your goals are. And that's important for you to define as well, because that really helps understand how much you really want to ramp it up, whether you would just want to do kind of a general, um, learn to eat nutritiously and age well, or you're trying to reverse a chronic illness and um, what your goals are with that, whether you want to do it quickly, whether you're a person who wants to add in one thing at a time and make slow changes to make it sustainable. So kind of addressing uh, the big picture, I think, is really important as we're getting started. And uh, once we establish our goals, then we can start with a plan as far as what we're going to eat and how we're going to build it and how we're going to make it last. So, I don't know if you want me to get into all of it right now or you want to jump in. Yeah, so I was just looking for the live stream. So if you guys are on Facebook, you know, feel free to share this. And so we do have a few questions. Um, <laughs> Mark it says, some of my family members are losing their minds in corona protection methods, letting groceries sit outside, spraying everything down, not letting any deliveries from restaurants come into the house. Is this overkill? Thanks. So that's a good question. So I think it depends on your risk factors, number one, to the extremes that you need to take. I think precautions are smart. Um, to my knowledge, there's not been any studies or evidence showing that these can be spread from groceries bringing into the home. Um, I'm not sure about delivery, food delivery or something, but um, Chris, I know you with your lupus and everything, you're, you guys are taking some measures. Do you want to maybe describe some of the things that you feel is important for someone like you and then maybe someone who's not as at higher risk? I can tell you what I'm doing, but if you want to start. Yeah, Mark, thank you for that question. Uh, so People with weakened immune systems or possibly or, um, you know, so chronic illnesses, especially the ones that are showing to be more high risk. So people with diabetes, high blood pressure, autoimmune issues, just kind of ongoing inflammation because this is a sort of become an inflammatory type illness um, and, and that's where people get in trouble and so for all of us type of people um, we definitely are taking more precautions we're definitely staying more isolated um, we are washing hands washing everything as it comes in supposedly the studies are showing that it lasts 24 hours on softer surfaces and um, up to three days on things like plastic and stainless steel so depending on what it is, if, it, if we can make like mail, if I can let it wait 24 hours before I open an envelope, that way I don't have to be worried. If it's something important, then I'll wipe it down. Whereas on softer surfaces. Um, and, and also as far as three days on, 
the food goes, um, if, it's been shown that if you order something carry, carry out or delivery, that if you heat it to at least 150 degrees, that, for, um, that will kill the virus. So at least 30 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour, at least 150 degrees will kill the virus. So if you are worried or if you were to order something and you were to heat it up, then you wouldn't have to worry so much about it. So, um, and then that does depend on the person, a healthier person, like Lori was saying, is going to have less of a risk and, and not have to worry about it as much. So might scale that back a little bit. Those are some really helpful hints. So what we're doing here is, honestly, we're very cautious when we're out. So we're wearing masks, which is a really weird sensation when you go to a grocery store and everybody's wearing a mask. I had to get fingerprinted for my New Jersey license. And um, afterwards, we're like, well, might as well just stop by Whole Foods. And there, you know, these huge precautions being, you know, stopping at the yellow uh, line, waiting for someone to ask you to come forward. Um, they're spraying down, you know, between each person that comes into the groceries um, to check out. They're spraying those all down, which is really interesting. We come home. Um, we use plastic bags. Granted, I usually use recyclable bags, but these are things that I can leave out in the garage <laughs> for a while. If these are things that are in uh, plastic or if they're fruit or something, I'll wash them. Um, but then other things are going straight to the freezer or they're sitting, you know, if there's something I put, you know, like if we have nuts, they're not doing bulk anymore. So we buy nuts in a plastic container. I pour them in the jar and I throw that away, I'm washing my hands before and after. And we've been doing that for four weeks. We have had cases in our county. So I'm not too worried um, about that. So, um, so basically those are the things that I'm doing. And so again, everyone just be aware that we are recording. We're streaming live to Facebook. So if you have a Facebook question, please feel free to also um, ask it there. Um, and if you do have any questions, just be aware that we are recording this and we'll be sharing it again later. So another question we have, will drug, uh, eluding stents prevent my endothelial cells from healing while on a whole food plant-based diet. So that is from Mark as well. Um, Chris, I don't know about you, but as far as the drug eluding stents, no, you're decreasing inflammation. Um, and no, it, they should not prevent your endothelial cells from healing while you're on a whole food plant-based diet. Not at all. Your body's still going to do what the body does. It just, you know, the drug eluding stents are important not to, to help prevent clotting as the uh, stents are being um, recovered, I guess you could say. Um, so that should be fine, not a problem. Chris, do you have any thoughts or? No, I agree completely. It's as, as, as important as ever to eat the whole food plant-based diet and to recover um, because it will heal the inflammation around them and decrease your risk. Agree. Absolutely. And then there's a question from Clara. Um, could you say something about the best diet for multiple sclerosis? Sure, yeah. MS, um, being an autoimmune disease, there's quite a bit of data with MS now, actually, and we've seen this in a lot of our patients. People on a whole food plant-based diet, eating an autoimmune um, healing type plan, which means um, really not processed. So some people, you know, on a whole food diets or plant-based diets will eat a little more processed. So really a, an unprocessed whole food plant-based diet is the best place to start for um uh, an autoimmune disease like MS. And at some point then, if, if, if you're not getting the results as quickly, we make sure you're eating plenty of raw. The raw has the more phytonutrients and vitamin C and anti-inflammatory factors that you're gonna need to really reduce your um, inflammation if it's pretty severe. So that would mean like leafy green vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, raw vegetables throughout the day, a little bit of raw fruit throughout the day, as well as a little bit of cooked. And so kind of building a plan around that. And then just make sure that your vitamin D is okay. Um, I do recommend taking vitamin D3, especially for people with MS. It's been shown to be really important. And um, make sure your B12 is okay. So. Perfect. I think that's really important. So they're going to be micronutrients to really optimize your immune system. You know, a lot of people, and Chris had mentioned this last week, you know, it's like we got to be careful about using the word boost because boosting is honestly, what happens with autoimmune disease, it's too much. <laughs> the autoimmune is too crazy and attacking itself. So those are some things to, to monitor. But micronutrients, it's really important that we, one, consume a healthy diet before we get sick or exposed. So then when we are exposed, our immune system can actually respond appropriately. And then when it's under the stress of an infection, 
that those needs are going to increase because things are speeding up. Your body is needing to fight. So you want to make sure you have the reserve of micronutrients. So it's important to eat it throughout, you know, before you get exposed, during exposure and after. So it's really, really important. Those are all um, super important things to keep in mind. I'll be creating some special videos too about the, what is the immune system and very specific micronutrients and the foods that you can do and what their role is in the body shortly. Um, just trying to put that all together. But those are some great great things. Um, let's see, if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to um, ask them on the Facebook Live or here. And then Chris, what, how would you say to help someone get started on a plant-based diet? What's the very first thing they should do? Like, is it mindset? Is it clean out the kitchen? Like, what is the first thing they can do to make sure they're starting out on a successful path? I'd like to start people with asking them why they want to do it what they're looking for so they kind of get a goal in mind and with that goal they can start to build a plan because it's not always perfect and easy and every second is it there's challenges for sure and so um i start them by saying well why you know do you why do you want to do this what are your goals and so as soon as they have their goals then boom then we're going for it so then we're building a plan and that may be adding in and for me that's the it's such an important part to add in. So um, adding in the colorful fruits and vegetables, the learning what the cruciferous vegetables are and how we can incorporate that into our meals, learning what, about leafy green vegetables and how important that is to eat them both um, raw and cooked and, and um, start adding in the colors of the rainbow, even if it's just one meal a day or adding in something with each meal. And from there, start crowding out um, the pro-inflammatory foods. So once you realize and start to understand the what the animal products are doing to our bodies, the inflammation and and how and how it's slowing down um, our age or facilitating our aging and um, rapidly causing inflammation and autoimmune symptoms you know, linked with cancer, linked with heart disease, you start crowding that out. And that may mean cutting down to one serving a day. That may mean completely cutting it out. That may mean just starting with breakfast and then slowly cutting it down or cutting it down to the size of your hand. And then maybe the next week you're cutting it down. So what, what, however you can um, make that happen. Um, I usually start with dairy products first too, because I think they're highly pro-inflammatory. And so I really want all my patients off dairy. Um, the sooner the better, basically. It causes direct inflammation in our gut linings. And so many people have say, well, I'm just having a little bit of my coffee or I'm just having a little bit here and there. Well, even that little bit is enough to um, offset any healing that's going on. So dairy is probably the number one thing that I would tell people get that out and start adding the good, colorful, real vegetables and fruits, start playing with beans, start playing with whole grains, start adding some nuts and seeds um, and start, start building new recipes. Or I mean, start trying the new recipes that we're going to talk about. Absolutely. And so when you have someone who's starting on this whole food plant-based diet and they jump full bore hundred percent, and now let's say that they have Sorry, I'm trying to answer. I'm looking at three places to look for questions that people may have. Um, the camera's going a little wild. Uh, so basically, if you um, are having someone who's doing this and they are going from the standard American diet to suddenly eating these amazing foods that are going to decrease inflammation and you know improve your insulin sensitivity. All this. So what should we be looking for if you're diabetic or hypertensive or you're on some type of medications that can have a really significant change um, in those type of, you know, vital sign parameters, what would you recommend that people look for? And then I can share what I do. Uh, so if someone has high blood pressure, for example, and they're on medications, they definitely need to be monitoring their blood pressure at home. So a whole food plant-based diet is probably one is better than any medication I've ever seen. It's so powerful and it can cause really rapid results. So they, um, it's really important that they're monitoring their blood pressure at home a couple times throughout the day. And, um, if they're going for it, all out going for it, I often will cut down their blood pressure medicine at the beginning. If they're going in slow steps, we'll just watch it closely and keep a close eye on that. And a similar thing applies with the diabetes medications. Um, some of those can cause life-threatening low blood sugar when they change their diet. And so based on what medications they're on, like things like insulin and um, gliburide, glipizide, that family, sulfonylureas, those can cause really dangerous low blood sugars. And so, uh, people on those medications, if they're really going for it again at the beginning, they have a plan and they have their recipes and they're really jumping in, um, we will definitely make 
significant reductions at the beginning and then monitor it very closely because we do at that point we'd rather be a little bit high than too low where they can get themselves in trouble so um, that's important that they're able to met, monitor it at home um, and so those are the two really important warnings that anyone with these illnesses should be aware of and people with high blood pressure should also be aware that the blood pressure can fall fast and sort of what to know um, what to know, what to look for as far as lightheadedness, how to sit quickly, drink plenty of fluids, uh, make sure they're keeping a close eye on us because we don't want someone getting lightheaded and having an episode. So real good points, Lori, for bringing that up. Yeah, absolutely. So these are, you know, the same thing that Chris is mentioning. I'm just reiterate that it's really important, like, especially if you're diabetic, I typically will cut someone's insulin dramatically, sometimes in half the first day, depending on their specific case in monitoring their blood pressure. Typically I'll watch them closely, but if they're on like more than two blood pressure meds, sometimes we're like, well, let's just see. And if they're kind of like, oh, my blood pressure runs in the 130s or 140s, we might, you know, do a quicker <laughs> follow up than someone who's still running in the 150s or 160s. Um, so there's some things there certainly to keep a, a, a track of. So blood pressure and diabetes for sure. Um, the other question we have is, I read um, whoops, that a low dose, um, I think she meant the uh, naltrexone, can help dampen down an autoimmune dis, uh, response such as that occurs with silicone and heavy metal poisoning. Is there some literature on this? Have you heard of it? Have you, Chris, you want to talk to that? Or I can. Yeah, there is some literature actually on it. And uh, my understanding is that the LDN um, actually dampens our um, some of our um, hormones that are affected from things like stress. And so um, different stressors, people who have a lot of anxiety can, might feel a little bit of benefit from that. Um, and there is starting to be, emerge some data. So when you ask if it's um, related with heavy metals or other toxins, I'm not sure of the data on that. I would have to review it. Um, but there is there is some some reports that it might be beneficial for that. So... Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So basically it acts like a, um, so what naltrexone is, it's like Narcan. So someone who's overdosed on some opiates, um, like Chris would have lots more experience with this than I would because I wasn't an ER doctor. You know, you literally can save someone's life. Um, so like the police would have it if they come upon someone, paramedics, that type of thing. So low dose, um, you know, they're looking at that that might be like an immunomodulator. So there's even been potential risks or improvement of like malignant tumors, mental health disorders, and then some autoimmune dis, you know, diseases because there, it seems to do something with binding to the receptors. Um, mm -hmm. So it's an interesting thing. It's still under study. So that's all I know about it. I don't know much more. So, um, but yeah, it's a great question. It's something to keep you know, an eye on for sure. It's very, very interesting mm -hmm. um, to really? think taking a drug that's used to reverse opiate overdose to potentially helping autoimmune diseases. It potentially helps. It helps a lot um, because a lot of autoimmune is stress related, as we know. I mean, that's a major, major cause. And um, it dampens that stress response in your brain by um, binding to those receptors. And that's huge. I mean, if you could right there help your own stress level um, just by taking that, it's, it, it is, it's huge. And it, it's starting preliminary to look very positive. So have to Absolutely. watch. Absolutely. So again, everyone welcome uh, that's on the, the, you know, joining us through the webinar, but also on Facebook Live, feel free, Facebook Live to share this or tag people who you feel might be helpful. Uh, we're plant-based docs. We're here to help answer any questions you have about a whole food plant-based diet or some other questions that you may have regarding your health and what we can do with lifestyle. So please feel free to share and, and answer, ask questions. So our next question is, since it looks like the main goal out there seems to be to develop a vaccine, to protect us from this pandemic, do you, or can you see an alternative to that, not being a fan of immunization as a general goal? Well, I, I could say what I'm gonna say, but go ahead, Chris. Um, my thoughts would be, um, it's a tough call, because yeah, vaccines we know can come with um, some side effects, but people are dying at high rates. And so if they can discover an antibody and put it out there and save lives and get the herd immunity that we need by getting um, big populations taken care of so that we know they have antibodies and they're not at risk, if that is gonna, what is going to protect the people who aren't able to medically get the vaccine and or the elderly or the more immunocompromised, that will save lives. And it's been shown over years with pandemics with things like 
measles. People died, lots of them. Things like um, polio, smallpox. So we right. actually annihilated smallpox because of the vaccine. And so it's right. really important at this point that we act together and um, we do get that herd immunity. So, um, and if you have a healthy, strong immune system, I have a strong hunch that the people who have the reactions to vaccines have a weak immune system and they're just so hyper um, inflamed at that point. So they get the vaccine and they have this response and they're like, oh my God, I had a terrible response. But if someone who's healthy, who's eating whole food plant-based, who's dealing with their stress, who's living a, a life with a good lifestyle, has a safe, protected environment already. And that vaccine, which is gonna, is gonna save lives potentially, um, they're gonna react much better. So my thought would be to take as good of you care of you can, as your, of yourself as you can, and then get the vaccine. That's my take. I don't know what your thoughts are. Lauren. Yeah, no, I agree. So I am a proponent of vaccines. Much of many people's thoughts are like, well, wait a minute, you're plant-based, you're a lifestyle, whole food. Absolutely, but I'm still a physician. As you know, look at the science; it saves lives. So vaccines um, certainly can cause you know some issues, but for the majority, it's saved millions and millions of lives. And so you cannot ignore that. And I and you know, it's just like I consider it a responsibility of those who can and take a vaccine to protect those who can't. Just like you said, and so that is why we immunize our children why I encourage, you know, we get the flu vaccine because over the years you build this, you know, memory and you're less likely to get the flu the next time. So everybody else has, we're not here to debate vaccines, but that is my personal take on it. Of course, every, you know, patient of mine, I do discuss the pros and cons individual to them. So again, this is a, this is a personal choice, just like other things. And, but it is a, it is a hot topic, but that is my own personal thoughts. So um, some other questions are, should we be concerned about fluoride in the water? Chris, do you have any ideas or thoughts on well, that? Yeah, my thought about that fluoride in the water is, as an autoimmune person, I'm very careful with chemicals coming in and I don't really like things being added. I want things as clean and, and natural. And the studies have not really panned out, is, is my understanding, with um, preserving our teeth once we're adults, different when we're children, but once we're adults. And so, um, and there is some evidence that things like fluoride can, um, interfere with iodine in the in the thyroid. And I'm not sure how good those studies are, but um, it, that's something I'm very careful about, and I try not to. So, whether there's good data if, if you're eat, drinking fluoride water and people are having problems, I'm actually not sure about that. So I can't really say. Um, it. Yeah, I would have to say too. This is not my expertise at all. So, I would say you know, do your due diligence and speak to your physician about it, you know, go to something like PubMed if you have a, a question regarding something such as fluoride in the water or something that you're worried about um, toxin wise, because honestly, you know, the science is ever evolving around a lot of different topics. So um, those are some things for me for sure. So just getting back to kind of the whole food plant-based diet, Chris, is there something here that you feel that we should be focused on especially because we had talked about it previously um, during this pandemic to really, you know, help optimize our immune system. So should we, you know, they're going to open up the country. And so states are going to be out and about. People are still going to be carrying this virus asymptomatically or symptomatically. And we will probably be exposed at some point. So we should do everything we can to optimize our immune system. So is there anything that you feel like we should really focus on to help with that potential, you know, exposure down the yeah, totally. So everything you can, like we said last week, to get your immune system in balance. And so that means reducing inflammation. So reducing the pro-inflammatory foods is going to be huge for that. Any particular food sensitivities a person might have, but you want to, um, that's going to be huge. And then what would we be adding in? In addition to a whole food plant-based diet, which is lovely, um, that's a wonderful place to start, but I feel like we can even ramp that up and we can um, step it up quite a bit. So um, garlic and onions are like some of my top two picks right now. And um, 
there's what's called a, um, allicin in garlic and onion. That's the allium family. And what those have been shown, what that's been shown to do, is it's a it's a phytonutrient, which is a nutrient from the plant in your onion and garlic. And what's that? What that's been shown to do is um, it's strongly antiviral, actually antibacterial. But even more than that, now there's some cool st studies that I was looking at with uh, raw garlic that it increases your IgA antibody in your mucous membranes, and that's in your mouth that's in your respiratory system, that's in your gut. Um, basically the first place that you're exposed to any toxin, the IgA is there, it's very nonspecific. It's part of the nonspecific rapid acting immune system. And it jumps on anything foreign right away and gets rid of it. And I'm assuming that this is probably what's going on with some of the people who are asymptomatic and they never even know that their, their immune systems are so imbalanced and robust that they're able to get rid of things and go about life and not even know. And so um, eat, the goal is to eat about a, one clove of raw garlic a day. And I actually should make this a challenge for everyone listening because it's quite amusing to see what that does to your breath and your dishes because <laughs> we've been trying that and our salad dressings are quite garlicky and our salads have little piece chunks of garlic in it now and it's it's kind of fun. But we love garlic and um, and so we're really ramping that up. So that is one that, or one and two, garlic and onion. Then the cruciferous vegetables, always the cruciferous vegetables. So that's the broccoli, kale, cabbage, cauliflower. Um, if, if you don't know that family, please look it up and make sure you know all of them and you eat all of them. So you wanna eat them raw and you can cook them a little bit. Those, it's interesting, the, um, the vitamins in them are like vit the B vitamins and vitamin C are uh, better when it's raw. When you cook it, you deactivate those vitamins, but you activate some of the phytonutrients a little bit more. And so, and you can pre, you can pre um, chop them before you cook them so that you activate even more of the phytonutrients. So definitely you want to get those raw, um, I mean, those raw and a little bit cooked cruciferous vegetables in every single day right now. Really, really, really important. If you can do variety, variety is really good because it adds different nutrients to keep you at a broad level to make sure you're getting everything that you in and have even more protection, more robust protection. If you can't eat what you have, if, if you're shopping once every two weeks, like I am, eat what you have at the end of those two weeks and make, and make it work. But I am, I'm buying big heads of cabbage right now because they last for a while in the fridge. And so um, two weeks later, I'm still have it there. I can chop it up and food process it. I'm doing the same thing with my Brussels sprouts. Same thing with um, broccoli only lasts about a week in the fridge. So I got to eat that the first week and then I'm switching over. Kale's just a few days. So we're cooking with a little bit of that. So I'm just trying to dial in that I'm getting variety, but um, having it last for right now. So um, after the cruciferous vegetables, that was number three. Then I would say mushrooms, definitely mushrooms ramp it up. And mushrooms are so cool. They do so many things. But one of them that I think is cool is part of your, um, your immediate immune system is your um, dendritic cells. And they're out there. They kind of have like, they look like fingers kind of, and they, they grab things if they're abnormal, like a virus or a bacteria, and they get help to your, your body to identify it and get rid of it quickly. So um, they're kind of like the soldiers out there. And we have them in our skin. So if you were to touch something that's infected, we have them in our, in our mucous membranes also, in our gut lining and in our lungs. And mushrooms actually enhance the function of dendritic cells. And it's been shown as people age that the dendritic cells start to shrivel down a little bit, but mushrooms help them kind of become more robust and work better. So I'm not sure the exact amount. I've read anywhere from like one button mushroom a day to like a cup a day. So um, somewhere in between there, I think is the right amount for mushrooms. Always cook them because if you eat them raw, they can add a, a little bit of a toxin to your liver. So you want to make sure that you do cook your, your mushrooms. And we do things like we cook our mushrooms in soups with our cruciferous vegetables, with our beans, and um, they're in the freezer. So that way I, every day I can grab a soup already made and I don't have to worry about the veggies going bad and has my mushrooms in it for me for the day. So that's um, something I've been doing. Um, those are my top four picks. And then I would say, I guess, leafy green vegetables um, would be probably number five for so many reasons. Um, all the nutrients and it's so anti-inflammatory and it really boosts our immune system. And the last one I would say is kind of a, is a different, a little bit different one. Number six, well, I guess I have, I have a couple more. Number six would be, um, wait, what, what did I just say? Oh, I just said the leafy greens. Num my next one is um, spices. Um, I think it's really important to start spicing things up. So, um, and you can do, what's better than the spice is 
the root sometimes, like turmeric root, if you can get your hands on any of that, and you can start adding to dishes ginger root, wonderful in stir fries and smoothies and sa um, salad dressings, um, but also the spices are good too. If that's what you have, that's great. Um, but things like red pepper flakes and cayenne pepper, um, rosemary, clove, cinnamon, uh, saffron, these are highly anti-inflammatory, potent anti-inflammatory, and they're all going to be um, very protective. Um, and so the more you spice up, if you have curry powder, if you have, this is a time to play with your spices and have some fun. And then the last one I would say is just vitamin C rich foods. And it kind of goes without saying that they're in your plant-based whole food diet, but it's just a good reminder because I'm stepping mine up as well. I'm adding kiwis, I'm adding oranges and grapefruits, I'm adding more broccoli, I'm adding more red bell peppers. And remember what I said, when you cook these, you lose the vitamins. So vitamin C is actually deactivated when you cook it. So this is another reason it's really important to eat raw, raw berries, raw, um, raw vegetables, leafy greens are really high in cruciferous. So if you're eating that salad every day, you're adding colors of the rainbow, you're getting your, your raw vitamin C in. And so that's really important to remember this right now. Uh, vitamin C is a strong immune booster and there's pretty good evidence supporting right now that vitamin C is actually helping to uh, knock out this virus and actually can kill it, help to help your body to kill it, enhance your body's own uh, function to kill this uh, virus. And so um, really ramp this up right now. Make sure you're getting enough raw. So those would be my top tips right now to support the immune system. Well, that and we're doing all of those. So yes, and that is phenomenal. So just a few things that you might want to add um, when you're cutting up your like broccoli and some things like that to you know really set those phytonutrients off. You might want to set them for like 15 to 20 minutes to let them kind of do their thing. Um, the other thing is you can mix raw with cooked. So then you're getting a variety of, of the uh, nutrients, you know, um, some things like tomatoes, you know, lycopene is better if they've been cooked. So again, try to do the raw, try to do the cooked and a variety of things. We actually create these little packages of smoothies. So we put in our greens and our berries and everything. And then honestly, it's so easy. You just throw it in the blender, add in either water, or your non-dairy milk and blend that up and you have your smoothie, it's ready to go. That also saves time and it saves especially those dark green leafies that go very quickly. Or <laughs> you don't keep eat those frozen or fresh? Yep, I keep them frozen. Nice. So they literally just pull them out of the freezer. I have banana in there, blueberries, strawberries. I have kale. I have cocoa powder and sweetened cocoa powder because nice. um, I like the chocolate flavor. And so, you know, it's enough to make a good 12 ounce um, smoothie and it's great. So it's just some ideas there for you. Um, we have a lot more questions. So everyone, again, on Facebook Live, feel free to also submit your questions. We're keeping an eye on the comments. So let me get back over here. So Jessica asks, here's a whole food plant-based diet question. Can you talk about nightshades and why some people think they are bad? Similarly, can you talk about lectins? Do these either, either of these groups actually cause real problems? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, as far as nightshades go, let's start with those. Um, yeah. In some people, they do. There's evidence with autoimmune disease, so especially the joint pain, so people with systemic joint pain, so things like lupus, um, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and other systemic joint pains that about 10% of the population um, are going to actually be susceptible or, or sensitive to the nightshades. And what it is is they, I think it's a protein in it that um, people, it will irritate them initially. And so we take that out and they do feel better. And usually I have people do about a 30 day trial. So eliminate them um, and see how they do. I don't start everyone with that, not necessarily because the other 90% of people usually don't react. And so um, I for one had severe joint pains and I did fine with those foods. They were not what caused my joint pains, it was other foods. So with food sensitivities, we're pretty, in, we're pretty individualized, I have found, but there are a few common ones and nightshades is a little bit more of a common one being that it's 10%. So um, you'll want to play with that. So that's the nightshades one. But if you're not, if after 30 days, you don't notice the difference, um, definitely bring them back in one at a time and give it a couple days. So if you add tomatoes, bring them back in a few tomatoes, and then the next day do a few more. And if you're feeling okay, then do a few more it, and give it, um, give it about 48 hours to know because you can have a delayed reaction with it. Um, if you do bring in tomatoes again, let's say, and you notice uh, a response, so you start to get achy again, then you're going to want to take it out and keep it out probably about six months, I would say. This does not mean forever. 
those sensitivities for the most part usually heal as your gut heals. It's a sign when you have food sensitivities, including to something like the nightshades, it's a sign that your gut is out of balance. Um, it's not normal to attack food, food and have inflammation. And so once you start to heal the, the, uh, back, the microbiome and you start to heal the gut lining and you get the nice mucus layer there like you're supposed to, those food sensitivities go away. And we're going to be talking a lot more. We're going to be writing out like how you, the steps you can go through to heal your gut and, and to help this get better. And for those of you who don't know, the nightshades include the family of tomatoes, red, um, bell pepper, sweet peppers, not black pepper, but the other pepper, sweet bell peppers and the spicy peppers, um, goji berries, eggplant and white potatoes. Those are the nice shades. And then the question was about lectins, question two. Um, and so lectins is a crazy thing how it's come out as being this bad guy because lectins actually have, um, one, they're, when you eat them raw, they can cause problems in people, but nobody eats raw like beans, let's say, right? They're a protein that's found in certain things like beans and whole grains when they're raw. Um, but two, they also have advent advantages. So they help with regulating that you absorb just the right amount of nutrients because you don't want to absorb too much calcium. If you ate a whole bunch of calcium, you want to absorb just what your body needs to keep you in balance. And that's why our bodies are so amazing. And so lectins have actually been shown to be helpful to do that and actually have, have been linked with preventing cancer and having many benefits down the road. Um, so that's just kind of the general lectin thing. As far as people who eat Again, lectins are found in things like beans and whole grains. I'm not sure if it's other vegetables as well, but those are kind of what I always, maybe some nuts and seeds too, I think, but th that's what I think of it. And um, so, so to avoid those food groups like um, legumes and grains is actually detrimental because we know that people uh, who eat beans live longer in all studies and all the longevity studies, the blue zones and um, the Seventh-day Adventists and all the longevity studies that looked at, they're always eating some sort of legume. Um, and same thing with whole grains. We know that people who eat whole grains have less heart disease now and, and have less cancers. And so there's really good evidence on both of those foods. That being said, there's I have a caveat as an autoimmune person that they're, they often can trigger autoimmune sensitivities at the beginning when someone's gut is a mess, when you're sensitive to a lot of foods, beans and whole grains can be big triggers. And so as wonderful as they are, as the goal is to get them in the diet, at the beginning, we often do take them out initially and we flood the body more with vegetables and a few other things and then let and then add those back in once the gut has reestablished a healthy environment and can safely tolerate. And then you definitely want to be eating them down the road. So it's kind of a long-winded answer to those questions. But. No, I think those are great questions. And just remember about the nightshades, they don't forget about spices that, you know, like cayenne pepper, um, things that come from the nightshades, also like condiments like ketchup and salsa. So, you know, if you are sensitive that 10% to the nightshades, you do want to be wary of other things, just not just the whole food. Um, lectins are found in most plants. They're naturally occurring. They're protective of the plant, but the highest containing are the beans, the tomatoes, lentils, potatoes, eggplant, things like that. Because again, but when you cook them, they're deactivated and it doesn't take long. And who eats a raw dried bean? Nobody. So not intentionally, you know, not intentionally. <laughs> you're going to be fine. Lectins are not going to be harmful to you. Please eat your plants. They're very good for you. And people who say that lectins are unhealthy usually have some commercial interest and are selling supplements that block lectins. And again, I will just leave it at that. So it's such a shame that it's happened because these are such good long health promoting foods and now people are so afraid of it. So right. unless you have food sensitivity where it's bothering you specifically, I would say, yeah, make that your goal. And they do so many things. They're prebiotic food. So they're feeding your microbiome and people who eat um, things like beans and whole grains have a more robust microbiome and that's what's needed for health and longevity. And so they're, they're wonderful prebiotic and they also help you the microbiome that you have, they're healthy bacteria to form the healthy um, metabolites like butyrate which then heals your gut heals your gut and actually heals you faster. It helps promote, uh, make things like vitamins and minerals and protect against cancer and makes essential fatty acids. So it's so, so, so valuable of foods. So hopefully you all understand, like if you, if you have a food sensitivity when you can't eat it initially, the goal will be to eventually get it in when you're healthier. So keep that in mind. Absolutely. Perfect. So I, I think it's just important that beans are the one food associated with longevity around the world. So Eat your beans if you can.
I start small. Lentils are a great way to start small amount then build up if your gut can't handle it. So great questions. Again, those who are on Facebook, please feel free to, you know, post your questions in the comments. We're keeping an eye on that. We'll be happy to answer those questions. We have people here in the webinar. We're at, um, answering that. Actually, questions. Lori, that's a good question for people. If they're getting a significant gas and bloating, what do you like to tell them to get them started? Cause they're kind of scared off now with this fiber. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, well, one, you, you have to eat the fiber to get the gut bacteria growing <laughs> and it should subside. But I usually start them, I pull them back and say, okay, instead of the raw, let's do cooked. So anything cooked and, you know, if we can process the, the raw into like a smoothie. Um, so we do, you know, cooked vegetables first, and then we do very starchy veggies. We may do white rice instead of brown rice because just to get the in into their system, um, and cook everything really well and do that for a week and then start adding slowly. The last things I add in are those whole grains, nuts and seeds and beans. And then I start with lentils. And again, it's a process. So every person is so very different. If you have someone with just a little bit of IBS, not a big deal. If you have someone with Crohn's, that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother level that you have to be very careful of. So yeah, that's what I typically do. Do you have any other suggestions or thoughts on that? No, I do. I do a very similar thing. And I, I typically have them start more with the cooked veggies, just like you said. And I might even have them blended initially. Mm -hmm. um, that break, every time cooking it is going to break down some of the fiber. Blending it is going to break down some of the fiber, even more of the fiber. So now you're getting the nutrients without having to, to chew it and to um, your body doesn't have to do any of the work. It's already there pureed. So that's kind of the easiest. And then from, and, and I will have them avoid most fruits at the beginning because that's mm -hmm. so high and wonderful, lovely fiber, but it's too much. Right. So it's really, it just starts with kind of cooked vegetables and then start adding in um, and then maybe you don't have to puree it and then maybe you can start adding in. And I just add it to a little bit of the raw, like, like you were saying before, we might have them add, someone add a little raw greens and then add the soup or cooked veggies on top of it. So you kind of mix it in. So you're kind of easing your way into it. But I would just say, be careful with that fruit at the beginning, because as much as we love it, it yeah. it's hard to jump into. And that. I would avoid like onions and garlic too, till towards the end as well. So that can be a little bit offsetting to some people. So we got a lot more questions. So let me jump over here to this one. A friend has high cholesterol, but very low blood pressure and he's thin. Would a, he benefit from a whole food plant-based diet? What should he do so his blood pressure does not decrease even more? I mean, personally, you, you know, anybody's going to benefit from a whole food plant-based diet, especially if someone who has high cholesterol. You shouldn't be consuming cholesterol. Your cholesterol will decrease depending on your genetics to a certain level. Um, your blood pressure, unless you have a certain ailment, your blood pressure will regulate yourself. So even someone who is, they're measuring their blood pressure, like someone could say, I typically run like 104 over you know, 60 something. Someone's go, Ooh, you have low blood pressure. I am not symptomatic. This is probably a normal blood pressure. So someone under 115, this is probably normal. So I don't know what you mean by low blood pressure. If someone is on a high blood pressure medication and it's too low and they're symptomatic, they need to revisit their doctor and say, you need a different dosage or a different medication. So there's some things here. Eating a healthy diet should not make a person with a normally or normal blood pressure lower. Um, it's, we can't be you can't be frightened away from a healthy diet, concerned that you're going to get low blood pressure unless you're taking blood pressure medication. If you're taking blood pressure medication and you eat a healthy diet and you get better, you will need to wean down or stop it altogether very quickly. And that's why a healthcare professional is very important to have as a friend in this journey of getting you know, on a healthier diet if you're on medication. So Chris, do you have anything to say to that? Uh, no, same thing. Um... Exactly. I would say, I would emphasize all the same thing. We do every now and then see people with low, really low blood pressure. And that's a sign that can be a sign of, um, stress sometimes that it's a little bit too low. So, um, it, some people use the term adrenal fatigue, but I don't really like that term. So yeah, I'm not a fan of that term either. So people, some people can have a little bit low blood pressure though, um, truly. And so that is just a lifestyle thing as well. So with the whole mm -hmm. food diet and the good lifestyle. Um, so I would say, yeah, don't ever shy away from this diet. So whatever's going on, your body's going to normalize it. That's the beauty of it. So I think this, this would be a perfect plan. Just to be careful, like Lori said, that they're not on medications. Yeah, so I would, um, the other thing here, she just mentioned, he's not taking medication. His pressure's low naturally, gets lightheaded. So two things. One, is he staying well hydrated? And is he eating enough food? So that could be another reason why someone has low blood pressure. So if I have an elderly patient, so I mean, it's family practice, you're taking care of delivering newborns to 
you know, my oldest patient, I think has been 104. This is when it is, are you eating enough food? Are you malnourished? And are you drinking enough fluids? And so that would be a question. And then there's some, like I said, there are certain diagnoses that can lead to a low blood pressure, but that's, that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother lecture. Um, with going whole food plant-based, if people are stop cutting, stop eating salt pretty rapidly, your right. kidneys get used to a high level of salt and they're used to excreting that salt. Your kidneys are amazing, right? They'll filter, filter the water, absorb water back and, and, um, and you'll lose the salt. And so if you're, you're used to a high level salt, and suddenly you go whole food plant-based and you jump right in and you cut your salt down dramatically, um, your kidneys are still filtering out that salt. So in the first couple of weeks to a month, we'll see people actually with lower than we actually love blood, blood pressures mm. perhaps. And that's a sign that their kidneys are kind of re, re, recalibrating. Yeah. Yeah. And then once they do, the blood pressure falls and like Lori's blood pressure 104, that's a perfectly good blood pressure unless someone's symptomatic, like she said, or have problems. So, so we kind of watch a person, but that initial person, if someone's used to having high salt and higher blood pressure and it falls, they may feel lightheaded. They may feel weak. They may feel yucky and not do as well. And that's going to take a little time to normalize. So one, you could slow down your transition to make sure you drink plenty of fluids and really rest and pay attention to self-care, eat good food, make sure you're eating enough, like she said, um, and let your body normalize. Absolutely. Those are very good points. And just uh, some other things too, guys, please feel free if you're on Facebook Live to comment and we'll answer your questions and share this um, comment, you know, tag someone, share this um, to whomever you feel like might be uh, having some questions, we'd be happy to answer them to the best of our ability. Different question, what kind of supplements, if any, would you recommend to improve the immune system? Any thoughts there? Uh, number one is whole food plant-based diet, mostly raw. So that's my number one supplement that I recommend to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, following that though, yes, vitamin D3 is really important. So especially like living here in New Hampshire, where we're so far north, um, we definitely need some extra D3. You don't want that level low. I'm not sure what the right number is. Is it high? Is it low? But I, I know that absolutely is it's not in a low range. So make sure you take enough vitamin D3 to keep it at least over about, I would say at least over about 40. Um, between like 40 and 60 is kind of what I usually aim for. And um, B12, especially if you're whole food plant-based, and then to help your immune system further along. When people have a lot of inflammation and say we're getting them off prednisone or you know we're tapering down their immunosuppressives or um, they're just really inflamed, having a hard time, we'll do a little bit extra EPA, DHA. Um, we'll try to do it through things like flax and chia seeds, green leafy vegetables, walnuts, but then also we might do algae, a little extra algae oil, and, and sometimes even a little bit of fish oil um, to calm them down. And then that's not something you want to be on for a long time, um, except for the, whole, the foods, the flax and chia seeds. But um, if you, we do the little extra EPA DHA as we're tapering off the other immunosuppressors or just to kind of start them. So that can be helpful. Though, remember something like that, that's an immune suppressant similar to those medications, uh, it's pretty potent too. And so taking a higher dose of that at a time when there's coronavirus running around is going to be a little more detrimental. So now you are suppressing your immune system, which is what autoimmune people might want a little bit, but you want to be careful with this if you're running around with, um, with the coronavirus. So I would say oh, that I'm only using that in patients who were actively needing it temporarily. And then absolutely turmeric and ginger, like we talked about before, strong immuno, um, immuno support with that. And so especially turmeric, I do, I like to recommend a little bit of turmeric right before each meal to help with the gut inflammation that tends to happen that leads to the joint pains or, or the systemic autoimmune symptoms, whether it's gut issues, whether it's neurologic changes, whether it's something else going on. So I, I like to recommend a little of that. And then just adding ginger to whatever during the days, it's a huge immunomodulator and really kind of dampens it down. Um, I also often will do a probiotic when people are just starting, especially when our gut, people's guts are a mess, um, when there's food sensitivities, when the inflammation is just kind of running rampant, when we know that the gut's a mess. And so we need to heal that. We want to normalize the microbiome. The way to really do it is feed prebiotic rich food, which is our, um, our plants, and um, a little bit of a probiotic can, has been shown to be helpful at the beginning too. So usually twice a day with meals, breakfast and dinner. Um, and that I think is my autoimmune, am I missing anything? I think that's what I use. Okay. 
Okay, so, and that's some really helpful um, information, especially if you're autoimmune disease. So for those who aren't just your normal everyday person, um, I'm a big fan of, you know, Dr. Khan, he says, test, don't guess, absolutely 100%. Um, and this kind of goes to a question we had from, looks like from Facebook, um, do you have a strong view on DHA, algae-based supplementation? I'll just kind of give my view on that. Number one, the one you absolutely need, and if a doctor tells you you don't need it on a plant-based diet is B12, mm -hmm. find another doctor. You need B12. We do not get B12 from, we don't, unless you're eating nutritional yeast, large amounts. And again, we don't even know how much is in that. You do not get enough B12 in the plant-based diet. Sorry, it doesn't come in any plants. <laughs> Please supplement accordingly and test your levels. Um, D3, majority of people are going to require. Um, so again, test and then, you know, you know, modulate that uh, dosage accordingly with the help of your doctor. Um, that's very important for your immune um, health. So there are some other micronutrients. If you're not eating a whole food plant-based diet in a wide variety that you might be low in. So, you know, things like selenium, iron, uh, zinc, different things like that. But again, these are things that can be tested and then you'll determine if you need to. Um, DHA, I have had a few patients who switch to a whole food plant-based diet end up with joint discomfort. And it's a very small percentage. I can think of maybe 10 at the most over eight years of seeing patients. And when we add an algae omega-3, um, they do very well. Um, I find that if you're on a very low fat diet, sometimes that's helpful to have that supplementation. So again, you know, if you're not eating the walnuts and those type of things, you might be worthy to look into. And again, you can test for that and then determine if that's appropriate for you with discussion with your doctor. And some people shouldn't be taking certain supplements. So um, those would be the three that I would be, you know, actively speaking to most patients regarding um, and then we have some other questions. There's <laughs> so many questions. I think we got those. Uh, how about do holy basil and green tea help? I'm not sure if they mean help your immune system or help with the coronavirus. I, I wouldn't say anything will prevent you from getting the coronavirus, but it'll help optimize your immune system. But I'm a big fan of green tea. Chris, do you have any thoughts there? I, I agree with you. I'm a huge fan of green tea. And green tea is a major immunomodulator. It's been shown to, um, so for autoimmune people, it actually increases what's called T reg cells, your T regulator cells, which is a type of um, immune cell which dampens down the immune system. So people with extra inflammation and you know all these different symptoms that we're having, you usually people have a low amount of the T regs. And so um, green tea's actually been shown to dampen it. So it's very beneficial. As long as someone doesn't have food sensitivity, um, green tea can be helpful for autoimmune. And as far as like coronavirus is concerned, it's also been shown to help support the immune system when it comes to natural killer cells and um, fighting off viruses. So it's got multi, multiple effects. It's also, it helps repair DNA. Um, it helps your mitochondria and it helps your, um, mito your microbiome, your gut become healthier uh, microbiome with less infl inflammation in the gut area. So it has multiple benefits. So if you like green tea, drink it. Be careful with too much caffeine though. That it definitely has caffeine. So holy basil, I, I'm not as well read. I've read a little bit about it and I think um, I'm not, I can't really give a really good answer about it yet, but I, I know it can help calm things down a little bit, but I'm not sure what the data actually shows on that one. Um, Dr. Krant from New York also says green tea also helps get zinc into the cells to fight so there we go. There's sure. some excellent help there. Yeah. Um, so another question from Facebook, if you have ulcerative colitis and not on an immune suppressant, do you still want to boost the immune system? So I think maybe this uh, person asking after we kind of mentioned we, I'm not a big fan of the word boost. I'm more fan of optimizing your immune system um, because I feel like there's going to be a balance, right? Chris, so do you want to talk about ulcerative colitis and immune suppressants in the word boost versus optimize and why yeah, we suggest you know, thinking that boost, way. Everybody's talking about boosting their immune system. And I think they just, they do mean optimize their immune system because um, the immune system is, is in balance. And that's why that's what the beauty of it, too much of it. And we're going to have autoimmune. So if you boost your immune system too much, you're going to have an autoimmune disease that can, that you can potentially have an autoimmune disease or allergies, um, asthma. Those are all a hyperactive immune system. So that's not our goal with the immune system. And if you have not enough, you can have cancer running rampant that you can't control these viruses. So you really want it and, and bacteria. So you really want it in balance where it, um, it does its job and it fights off 
the bad stuff, but it's not going crazy and it knows how to shut down. And so that's having, making sure all the parts of the immune system are in balance. And so it's optimizing it and bringing it to balance. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and so what was the question about that as far as? So they were just worried about, do you still want to boost or optimize? I mean, she said, yes, optimize. So boosting versus optimization. So I would say, yes, you want to optimize your immune system because when you have an autoimmune disease, you obviously already have your immune system is not optimized. It's not in balance. So you want to feed it the foods that will allow it to hopefully, you know, kind of recalibrate and uh, get back to an optimal state. And it doesn't mean that you don't require medications. Um, it just means that we're trying to get you into the best health we can with the, the right food. So medications are still sometimes required, even those who are eating a whole food plant-based diet. But do you have any other thoughts on maybe ulcerative colitis specifically? So ulcerative colitis, especially if it's active, just like every autoimmune, you're going to want to get that in check. Um, and like even myself, I'm really ramping things up right now with coronavirus, like really doing everything I can to make sure my immune system is quiet. And so um, eating, eating the foods that don't trigger you. So in addition to whole food plant-based, you don't want to be eating foods. So beans might be way too much for you to digest right now. Um, whole grains might be way too much to digest. And you may be someone who, who's going to want to start with something like cooked vegetables, easy peasy, get some nutrients in. You want to get the colors in the greens, the oranges, the yellows, the reds, those colors um, are the carotenoids in it. And the, and the cruciferous source, all those compounds are going to really heal you. And again, depending on how, where your symptoms are, that would vary with how um, strict the diet was, how precise versus whether it's just more broad, you know, maybe you're, you're in remission and you're doing great, in which case you're going to be wanting to eat salads and um, a little more um, different types of foods that you can't tolerate when it's inflamed. So um, removing tri potential triggers. So anything that's irritating your gut, if you drink a cup of green tea and you find that your symptoms are worse, then you get that out. It's not for you right now. Your body's reacting to it in negatively. And so um, you're going to want to pay real close attention to triggers. Um, things like tumor can be real helpful for also colitis. And really mind-body is a huge component of it also. So this is a stressful time. We're worried about a lot of things right now. And so I would say extra, extra attention to mind-body to help calm things down right now and really get that under check um, are, is really important. Absolutely. And Patricia is asking these questions off Facebook and she said, so cooked fiber is okay. Yes, um, cooked fiber is okay. And then she just came off steroids. So Patricia, you know, you may actually do real, I know, right? I'm excited for her. You might do really well to consult with Dr. Um, Miller at plantbasedtelehealth.com. Um, she'd be an amazing person to discuss. And honestly, I have thyroid disease and she's my doctor. So I'll leave it at that. She's my doctor's doctor. So you guys check her out. You can check, you can see both of us at plantbasedtelehealth.com. We're also adding more doctors and covering more estates. So please check us out. Um, I love working with autoimmune people. So if you're out there, yes. yeah, uh, make an appointment with me if you're interested, because I totally relate and been through a lot of it as well as seeing a lot of patients with autoimmune. So there's some nuances sometimes where we get caught up and we're not making progress or we're not getting what we want. And we are different. So there isn't a one size fits all I found. Um, there's a basis, but then there's a lot of little tweaks that we can do to get people on track. So if you're struggling when you're having questions or anything, please do contact me because I'd be so happy to work with you. And just, you know, another story, you know, Chris had lupus and I've known Chris for almost a decade and we did a webinar just recently. And I also had her on the podcast. If you check out the healthy human revolution podcast, we talk all about uh, Chris's story and the, the, there were a webinar all about autoimmune disease. And she talks about her story and answers a ton of questions. So please um, Dr. Chris Miller, she's asked, sorry, who? Dr. Chris Miller, who's the doc who's been talking with me um, at plantbasedtelehealth.com. So check out the Health Human Revolution podcast and the other on um, the Plant Based Telehealth um, page. You'll see the webinars or our YouTube channel, and we're posting those every week as well. So um, she's a huge resource for autoimmune disease. Um, so we have a, a few other questions. Let me see here. Can you talk about fermented foods? What about fermented dairy? And what about sodium in these foods? Good question. Really <laughs> good. Good. It's a very good question. 
Huge, it's funny. I get that question a lot, actually. Go ahead. I'm a huge fan of fermented foods, to tell you the truth. Um, they, I think they're really good for us, especially if you can do your own, number one. Um, when you get the local bacteria and you can you can adjust the amount of sodium in it. Um, so, And it's been shown things like lactobacillus, which is found in kimchi, which has been actually been very beneficial for repairing our gut and, and longevity. Um, that being said, there's some caveats to it for sure. So there is a lot of salt in it and you do need to pay attention to that. That is a high amount of salt. So if you can buy the lower salt kinds or rinse it or um, again, make your own is really the way I try to recommend it to people. Um, fermented dairy, I'm not a fan because it's dairy. Um, and we know that the inflammation is caused by the dairy products. So there's so many other ways you can get um, fermented and and. Uh, probiotics in you without having to eat dairy. That being said, you don't have to eat fermented food. Eating prebiotic food, such as anything with fiber resistant starch, so in your beans and your green leafy vegetables and your mushrooms, your onions, all those types of foods are, um, are going to feed your good bacteria. So it's not like we have to, but there are some studies that it can be beneficial. And if you like it, which I love fermented foods, are fermented veggies. So um, you definitely want to, you can definitely bring them in and they are healthy promoting when people are having inflammatory reactions early on in their autoimmune or with gut issues I don't bring them in initially I find that can be irritating and that might be the salt um, salt is definitely a trigger for autoimmune remember that so another reason you don't want to eat high salt so um, I won't bring it in until later on when someone's healthy doing well and we rinse it and try to buy low sodium or make our own or do something like that that's my take on it absolutely and then we have a question here from Facebook um, please, guys, on Facebook, feel free to comment and share this um, video as we're going along with anyone you feel like you could uh, that needs it. So, um, Scout's asking, eating this way keeps me so thin, five foot seven, 115 pounds. How can I gain weight eating this way for almost three years? So, you need more calories. So, you need more of the calorically dense foods if you're looking to gain weight. Um, are you eating enough right now to sustain your weight? Um, I would say you definitely want to check maybe a basal metabolic rate calculator. You can figure those out and that would give you your basic needs. And then depending on your activity, if you're highly active, an athlete, running long distance, um, lifting weights or a labor intensive job, you're going to require more calories. So this is a matter of more calorically dense foods, nuts and seeds, your beans, whole grains, making those primary Objectives, and on occasion, you may need to add, you know, like a meal replacement powder that's plant based as well. Um, smoothies would be good. You could throw in nut butters, things like that. But again, that's typically ways. Or you may just be genetically thin, like some people I know that could eat anything or an elephant and never. It's just amazing to me how they can stay thin. But go ahead, Chris. Do you have any thoughts? No, I don't have much else. I always gauge it by your energy level too. If you're feeling weak or you don't have good energy, that tells me you're definitely not getting enough calories. So if you feel good and you're pumped and you got energy and you're running and like, then I may worry about it a little less, but I agree with everything else you said. Yeah. Yeah. They, they said, uh, I eat all day, 68 years old and retired. So how's your energy? That's a good, that's a really good point. And honestly, I'm five foot seven. I was 118 graduating high school it you some people are just naturally thin I'm well more than that now but you know um some people aren't so for those of you who aren't naturally thin it's okay <laughs> I'm very sensitive to what I eat and I have to watch it so yeah, I, okay. well I'm at this point now I, I can't eat like I do when I was a teenager at all so you know as you get as you know hitting that 50 is a bigger deal but um she okay Scott has great energy so honestly Good. Just be consider yourself blessed. You get to eat a lot of food, stay thin, and feel great. So, but I do agree with Lori. Add those calorie dense foods in because sometimes with plant based, we're we're cautious. Don't eat too much of this. So I would definitely ramp that up to you a little bit. See if you notice a difference with how you feel. Yeah, and if you have any, uh, <laughs> I'd love to take you offline and talk to you about food. This is oh, there's so many yummy recipes that are way calorically dense that I can't have a lot of. <laughs> I was like, oh, let me tell you what you could eat. <laughs> and then, then send me pictures so I can enjoy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So I don't want to um, know. <laughs> oh, it makes me jealous. I see my, my boys who are like 21 and 24, and they're just like chowing down on food. I'm like, ah. <laughs> I look at that. I just can't. Uh, anyway, okay. I, I Sorry, I digress. <laughs> All right. Are dried mushrooms versus canned okay? 
I'm not sure how much you lose on dried, but I definitely know you still have nutrients in dried mushrooms. So mm -hmm. um, we have dried and we do use them. So we rehydrate them and then use them. And there are still nutrients in it. So I'm not sure what the percentage that's lost, but, um, and really the best is fresh, obviously frozen, but then eat what you have. Like if that's what you have right now, they're, you're going to get benefits from it. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, I would say, if, you know, the can just be careful about the salt content being added. And other than that, absolutely. Um, sometimes the dried will have, you know, added, um, preservatives that you may not want. So just some things to keep in mind, or if you're drying yourself at a low heat for a long time, I think you're good. Uh, Mark asked, should we be concerned about trace of, uh, traces of arsenic found in brown rice? You hear so many different things, it's so confusing. So any thoughts, Chris, on that? It seems like there is arsenic now in brown rice, unfortunately, and that's kind of runoff from the soil. Mm -hmm. It's been contaminated, even organic brown rice. And so, yeah, arsenic is um, neurotoxic. It, has, um, it can cause problems in the body. And so... I am being careful now. We still do eat brown rice, but um, we're being mindful of it, making sure rotate it with other other foods. We try to buy it. We buy it organic, but that's even been shown with it. So you do need to pay attention if you're eating it all the time in large amounts because you don't want to get arsenic. High levels of arsenic can certainly cause problems. Um, things like wild rice from Minnesota, I guess it is um, the organic wild rice from Minnesota that grows in the kind of the riverbeds up there. Supposedly that's like the cleanest non-contaminated form of rice available these days. But hopefully as we start to find areas where they clean up the soil and can get grow fields for rice, we'll start to get better brown rice that's not contaminated anymore. But right now I would be a little bit mindful of it truthfully and um, either not eat too much of it or just be mindful and mix it with other things or something. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, just be wary of where you're getting it. Look at places that have the highest you know, arsenic content in their soil. I think the Southeast is pretty bad um, in, yeah, certain foreign, mm -hmm. yeah, in certain foreign countries. So, you know, just be mindful of it. And you, as long as you're not eating every day, and then you may choose not to consume it at all. And that's fine too, because there's other whole grains, quinoa, you know, that you can um, burrow. There's so many other whole grains that you can replace. I mean, rice, rice is and, pretty wonderful, but yeah, there's other good ones. Yeah, but also, but if you're on a tight budget, honestly, brown rice is, you know, it, it's a it's a great staple to consider. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, you have to weigh, you know, it's just like, you know, versus conventional versus organic. If you can get organic, fabulous, wonderful. But if I, if I have to choose between, you know, conventional fruits and vegetables versus no fruits and vegetables, I'm going to say, get your conventional fruits and vegetables and just wash them well. But again, you can't wash off the arsenic. But, you know, these are, these are the questions that, you know, you have to, to look at and individually answer. So um, looks like one of the last questions here is how about seaweed for iodine needs? Hmm. Good question. Yeah, so seaweed has been shown to have iodine. There's different amounts of iodine in different types of seaweed. So um, you'll want to look up how much iodine is in that seaweed. The thing with that is it is a, it's a whole food and it's always good to get your nutrients from whole foods. So I'm a fan of that. But it's hard to monitor exactly how much you're getting because we don't know how much is in each seafood. It might depend on where it's growing and how healthy an environment, how how plush the, the environment was with, with iodine for it to absorb in the first place. And so, or how flush. And so um, that is a tougher one to get the exact right amount. And you'd want to eat the, around, the, around the same amount every day of the same, um, same type of iodine or same type of seaweed or sea vegetable. So um, it can work. It absolutely can work. So if that's what you like to do, absolutely. Um, if you're not sure, then we do do a little bit of a supplement just to be sure. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with everything you said there. So it looks like we've answered all the questions. We've been on for just over an hour. And so I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And just please feel free to, you know, look at our um, plant-based telehealth uh, website, or not website, well, .com website, if you would like to make an appointment with either Chris or I or the other docs that are coming on. Um, we see we're patients were in over 30 states. Now we're working to get to all 50. And again, we're very thankful for you guys joining us and you can sign up for additional webinars. They are also on the plant-based telehealth Facebook page, and we will be posting these to our YouTube page and sharing them to Facebook as well. So thank you everyone for your questions. And we so appreciate you and please spread the word that if anyone needs a plant-based doctor, they can find us in this national practice that we have launched with Anthony Masiello. And 
we're super excited for you guys all joining us. So thanks everyone. And if you guys have any questions for next week, please send them our way because we'll prepare and we'll be ready for you next week. So absolutely. Absolutely. So please comment and uh, we'll be happy to answer those. So have a great one, everyone. Bye everyone. Stay safe.